Hello, everyone. Um, as, was, uh, as I was already partially introduced, uh, my name is Peter Bubisinger. I'm just, um, so you can read it on here, who's standing here and being really smart about free software and digital archives and uh, what kind of kid is up there. Um, just I made the experience look a bit younger than I am and I started with 21 years, 2002. So I'm 30 now and I had my hands on national archives like Voice of Vietnam, Austrian broadcasters, and whatever in the field of mass digitization of audio content. So funny, but I was actually invited here as a member of the Free Software Europe Foundation to speak about free software. And since I had my hands really getting dirty with archives in the last few years, I can just provide a lot of inside information as a developer and um, trainer in that field. Um, first of all, I wasn't really sure what kind of audience to expect, so I thought I'll just like fresh up or like introduce what free software is, because my experience is a lot of people have a difficulty with the word free, as it means like, hey, it doesn't cost anything. So the important thing is, so we are talking about the same thing here, is free software defines itself over four freedoms it gives to the user of an application. Those four freedoms are the right to, to use it for any purpose, like really for any purpose. If you want to have lasers on sharks, free to do it if it's free software. You may study it. This is very important, especially in the content we are meeting here today, because we're talking about cultural heritage and um, like social content and educational usages and all this. So um, study is something which is really important these days. And also share. Um, the right to share a piece of software. And also, and this is a um, often, hmm, how to say, um, a freedom which, is, which people don't really get at the first point. It's the right to improve stuff. So a lot of users consider themselves just like, okay, I'm taking whatever I get. People who do software give it to me, I buy it. They make it, I use it, that's it. But very often uh, in, in everyday situations, people find well, like limitations or problems with programs. They're like, they work around it because they ain't able to improve it. They might complain about it in forums and stuff, but it's really important to be able to improve stuff, like fix bugs, and then also pass this on to other users. That's not really the case with proprietary software these days. So people are used to, don't really, um, those four freedoms are not every day, it's not the default case. And again, the common misunderstanding, free does not mean you don't pay for it. Often it's free, but for instance, I am working as a developer of free software and I get paid for it. But I still provide those freedoms to the people I give the application to. So <clears throat> all this sounds really nice and in the domain of archives and cultural heritage, those freedoms are actually quite important to, to do the job. Not only, to, not only for the content um, and to access it, like what all the European project is about, it's, you have to start somewhere and create that content, like digitize it, handle it. You gotta, it's all the archives that actually have to do the work right now and Europeana is like um, connecting this. Well, if those freedoms actually perfectly match the domain of archives, why isn't free software used or at least known more well in the archival domain? And it's funny, but um, we're, we're often talking about important things and important things, especially if we're talking about a lot of money and institutions and you've got a reputation and it's like the National Archive of Austria. You gotta do professional stuff. And I hear the word professional a lot in uh, my field of work. And people are like, um, yeah, we're doing professional here. We're professional archives. We're like broadcasters or the National Archive, and they are professionals. But often professionals consider 
the equipment they buy, which includes hardware, software, and whatsoever, to be professional connected as um, directly to brand and price. So I'm really speaking of practical terms here. This is like a perception of what people actually um, use as tools <clears throat> whenever they do a job. So um, when you say, hey, there is like an open source tool or free software, as I prefer to call it, to do the same job, I often had the experience that professionals in that field said, hey, come on, first of all, nobody I know who is professional ever used that, nor knows it, and it's free. It's got to be unprofessional or of lower quality. And these things are why free software is not that popular in that domain. And no one's ever done this before, and nobody wants to be the first to try it out. So they stay with proprietary products, and I understand their point of argumentation. Because I wouldn't be, I mean, you got to be really eager to be the first one to try it. <clears throat> but what's really important is quality is price and license independent. So you can get really buggy software under all kinds of licenses, like super proprietary, I own your ass <laughs> licenses, or free. Doesn't matter, because the quality comes from the people who develop it. And the second thing is within any price range. Believe me, I've been a developer for like 15 years now, and I've had my hands into several projects. You can get software that doesn't cost anything. You download from the internet for nothing, and it has like interpolation algorithms for audio that like kick ass. And then you can also buy stuff worth thousands of euros, and the quality is not, it's not really connected. So um, <clears throat> it's time to rethink this professional versus free thing when dealing with high cost equipment and brand names. Like recently, since I'm now having my hands in video digitization for the Austrian MediaTek, we ran across equipment that, like, ranging from 3,000 to 12,000 euro hardware analog video converters, um, they were actually mod mangling your content silently. You couldn't, we, act, we, we stumbled over this by developing test methods. So this is just one example why brand and price don't necessarily mean quality. I don't say that things like this don't produce high quality output, I'm just saying it's not the only criteria. So. <clears throat> Well, that's the pre-assumption. Professionals don't use free software because it's free. It's not really professional. It don't cost anything. We don't go for stuff that is like below several thousand euros. But some professionals, I, I, I love the BBC, by, by the way, because they're really into pr not only using open source and promoting it, they're also producing free software and uh, the BBC are professionals. They got their archives, they are broadcasters, and they got tons of text explaining why it is good for them as a user, actually, of free software, and as a user of, their, of these tools, and why they prefer them under a free license. They even developed the Rack, which is a, um, an, a free format video codec for several uh, occasions, Inject. Uh, video digitization system, and many more. You can check out their open source project website. It's really interesting, especially when you are dealing with archives. Industrial Light and Magic, I don't know if you're all familiar with that. They're the ones uh, behind the special effects of Star Wars and stuff, sort of like really huge in Hollywood. They developed an open EXR film codec for scanning film material. Um, while dealing with film and video, we had to evaluate several codecs and formats for long-term storage, and I stumbled across this. And hardly anyone knows it, because they're professionals, and they've published it. Then there's the Austrian Media Take, and they've, they're currently, they've just released um, a video digitization system. So there are like several examples, including Cinepaint, loose, used in Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Last Samurai, and so on. So, it might be really time to rethink this professional versus free. But what are the benefits? Like, I'm, I've been working for archives like as customers, and they're like, what's in it for me? See, 
and just, we don't have too much time, so I really have to compress it all a bit. We got like four super buzzwords, independence, price, uh, interoperability, and sustainability. And I want to look at those four benefits as an end user of free software in the domain of archiving stuff. Let's look a bit in detail. Independence. Um, it's really hard to do this without bashing any vendor. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to be really, really careful how to say things because um, I want to point out the, the positive stuff. They're not like, that's negative. So what is to consider as an archive? The archive domain is a really small niche market. Honestly, how many archives do you have per country? Like large scale archives? Not too many. And then you, you got lots of countries globally, but to sum it all up, even on the whole world, archive domain is a really small market. Um, and well, there are a small number of off-the-shelf solutions. You can't walk into the next media market and go like, yeah, I'll get like the mass digitalization system. We added the third one on the left side. Uh, thanks a lot. That's $29.99, great. That's not the case. So you really have to find a vendor that knows about how to deal with archives. You got special demands. And this often leads to custom in-house solutions, which glue together some proprietary off-the-shelf solutions but off the shelf in a niche market means they have like a handful of customers worldwide. So you're like custom proprietary, which puts you in a way far out position. You're quite alone out there. Um, ever had a problem with a special solution you use in broadcasting uh, fields and you go on the internet because you have a bug or a problem or an error message with that tool and you Google it? Hardly anyone has this tool because it's highly specialized. So you're quite alone out there. And this has high potential for vendor dependence. No, my clock. Oh, sorry. I, in order to stay in schedule, I have this small clock here, which just turned itself off. OK. Um, so with free software and free formats, you get a free choice of Who's, your, who's, who's creating the tools you use? Who offers the tool you use? Who supports it? And local support, which is very important, because I, I know that um, if you only have one vendor and he's living on the other side of the world and you need support for the, from them, uh, it's a bit difficult. So with free software, you can even get local support if you want to. And it's no black box. It's very important to keep your stuff alive to keep your equipment running and to understand it. And often it's uh, with free software that um, you're working with common tools. Even if somebody develops some custom solution, they're not going to write anything, everything on their own. Why should they? They take this from here, this from there, it's everything on their free license, great. Form up a new thing and you have a common code base. I've been developing, developing a video archiving solution and I didn't have to write the transcoding tools. I can produce several output formats. I didn't have to write this on my own. And when I found issues, bugs, or made improvements, I put them upstream. And I have a really large user base with that tool, although they have nothing to do with archiving. Another, the second issue, like the second benefit is price. That's like really difficult to, to um, I don't know to look at it because people often just see, okay, I go there, pay this, and that's my costs. But especially with archives, we're talking about, um, uh, what's the word for never ending? Like um, infinite, <laughs> uh, infinite uh, migration and usage of their stuff. I mean, we don't wanna lose our content at one point in the future. So, again, we have a niche market, which means by default usually high prices, because otherwise for the vendor, it doesn't pay off. Custom solutions necessary, high prices again. With free software, you have reusability of existing solutions. One archive paid for developing or improving a free software solution, another archive can benefit from exactly their investment 
and contribute additional uh, resources like money for further improvement, um, know-how, they can exchange, which is not really the case with proprietary solutions because not even in-house you're allowed to share your tools. Um, and you get free choice of suppliers, less forced upgrades, and you have interoperability. This is very important for uh, flexibility and sustainability, and proprietary vendors usually don't benefit from interoperability because why should they? With free software, you benefit from interoperability and the people who make this, uh, it's a win-win it's a situation for them. And missing features can always be added on demand, so you're on the totally safe side as an archive. Because um, with replayers, like I come from the audio domain, and we've been really happy to keep the, the tape recorders alive. We've got the schematics, we've got the service manuals, and every institution I saw that had replayers, gramophones, wax cylinder playback machines, they had to be able to keep their equipment alive. And this is the same thing you have to think about and keep in mind about your software solutions and tools you buy right now. And with free software, you get the source code and the rights to keep it alive, to service it, to modify it, and adapt it to your needs. So it's like the perfect match for archives. And by definition, it forces sustainability. Because um, as previously heard, it's very likely that a free solution just sticks around. It's not going to get lost somewhere. If it was online once, you probably will find it. And people can look inside and keep it alive. And you've got no artificial restrictions whatsoever. So this is what I, what's my experience, which is virtual immortality for an archive and its content, which is really important in a practical term. So to use a really nice business word, what's my return on investment? Because this is really often when the suits get together and consider what to buy for an archive. What are the solutions? Often they're not really talking about solutions, but about products, which is why return on investment is really important for the one who actually buys it and uses it. And we're not only talking about money here, because we're talking about cultural heritage and infinite migration. Because you have to migrate your storage, you have to migrate your format. And with free software, knowledge and tool transfer is possible between institutions. As I said, one archive uses that tool, the other archive comes and says, hey, cool, how are you doing that? That's really nice. Can I use the same tool? Can you show me how to do this? And they can say yes, and here are the tools. So they can share this. And you got your independence. No vendor can say, you're mine. Or you can just say, I want to have this from someone I trust or someone who can do the job. They're, you got interoperable systems, and if they're not as compatible as you want them to be, you can just ask someone to add that feature. You got sustainability, because you got the schematics, the source code, and the right to keep it alive and adapt it to your needs. And well, this is actually openness in its purest form, which is something that, that word, I've heard it here like a lot of times, and um, this is how to really make it and in the real world. Um, oh yeah, I get many, many more benefits, but there are too many to list here. That's it. Uh, if you have any questions, we're probably not having them right now, as I see in your face. Yeah.